quickly and then ending up with subpar results because you didn't frame the problem correctly. Um, again, if audio is still an issue, please let us know on the chat, but uh, I haven't seen anyone motioning to me around me, which means I, I think we're good. Um, so the next part was around ideation. So if you have defined the right problem, how do you start to identify potential solutions? And identifying solutions isn't just around sticky notes and having a wall full of sticky notes as a lot of people like to think it is. Ideation can be more strategic and it's really about thinking about the context in which you are operating under. So this list here, and we'll send this presentation out after, afterwards, but this list is, is by no means comprehensive, but it's, it's a list of the types of things you need to think about when not just generating ideas, but generating good ideas and then starting to narrow down what ideas that you've collected and start saying which ideas are we actually going to test. So once you have the ideas that you're gonna test, it becomes around really rallying people to your cause. It's around how do you actually go from an idea to implementation? And I can't think of a better person to really give us uh, their perspective on this as someone who has lived this uh, much more than I have. Uh, and this is Alex Roberts, one of my coworkers. So Alex, why don't you talk about what is an actual innovation proposal? Thanks, Kevin. So an innovation proposal is about turning an idea into something actionable. Uh, it doesn't matter how good your idea is. If it's innovative at all, it's going to, be need, it's going to need to be developed somewhat. Um, this holds if it's just your idea for something you want to test yourself and do in your own workspace, or even if it's a, an idea for the whole of government. Whichever it is, it's, you're going to get better results if you think through how the idea actually fits with the reality of the context you're in. That's what an innovation proposal is uh, getting to. And because it's dependent on the context, there's not going to be one magical answer as to what an innovation proposal should look like or how it can succeed. But the aim is to think about some of the commonalities that exist, no matter if it's just an email to your manager about, hey, I've got this idea I want to try out, or if it's some prototyping with colleagues, or if it's an official, official budget proposal. Um, so if we'll go on to some of the tips uh, that we think are important for developing successful public sector innovation proposals. Um, Kevin might want to explain the, the context of the diagram here. So what, one of the things that I like to think about uh, with proposals and how I've seen it happen in uh, many of my colleagues and myself is that proposals are the most nerve wracking time during an innovation. Um, you're trying something new, you're trying to rally people to an idea that they may not be comfortable with. Um, and so regardless of what format that proposal takes, um, it's a very nerve wracking time because it's really one of those times that it starts to either serve as validation or serve as you really trying to rally someone um, uh, to your proposal to get the resources needed for it. So with that said, I could not think of a better uh, and more apt description than someone sweating profusely over and over uh, during the during this slide. Uh, so the first one we, we think about is that it, it's not just about your proposal. It's a, important to understand the strategic context that your idea is happening in. So it doesn't matter if your idea is the best one invented since the creation of plausible deniability. If the context isn't right, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, if you want to improve service quality at the same time, there's a focus on streamlining. Uh, your idea is probably not going to get uh, traction. You need to appreciate the strategic context and what else is going on. Is there a related agenda that you can uh, tack on to? Is there a political or executive leadership message that you can link to and say, hey, there's a clear signal that this is something important. My idea helps with that in this way. Is there a way you can frame or reframe your idea to either better match the context that you're in or at least to make it look like it does, uh, because sometimes that's just as important. The second issue is this uh, rallying people to your cause. Uh, a key challenge with innovation is that it's new. So you don't necessarily have any ready mental models or examples that you can point people to or that people will have in mind when they're thinking about your idea. So you need to appreciate how to really communicate with your audience and tailor it accordingly. Um, 
So sometimes that's a matter of how can you address your message in a way that fits with your decision makers' preferences? So do they like to know all about the Claker or do they like to know about the, the pain points and the story around this idea? Or do they like to know about who else has done this? Is this something another agency has tried and they want to uh, be in on this? Um, so thinking about how you can tailor that message. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that sometimes you'll have to uh, give this message to multiple people and they'll have multiple preferences. But you've got to do what you can. Um, and think, who will be the most effective voice uh, for your proposal? Is it you, or might it be someone else? Because sometimes uh, you might, it might be your idea, but someone else will be able to sell it better to the relevant decision maker, um, or advocate uh, the, the argument in a stronger case. Point three, um, but that's not what I meant. So don't assume that the merits of your idea are apparent or readily understandable. Uh, it, being novel, being different, um, it's very easy for innovative ideas to be misinterpreted. So how you got to the answer of this idea may not be enough to get others there. You may have had personal experience or seen things or heard things or done the research that others haven't. So you might understand why this idea is important, why it will address the things that are being talked about, but others uh, might need more than that to get them there. So how can you make your proposal real and meaningful? Now that might be through prototyping, so making it visible and tangible. It might be about finding other peer voices that can uh, sell this idea. It might be about concrete use cases and pointing to instances where, hey, this is a problem we have right now, our current uh, solutions are failing in the following ways, and here are some examples where this exam this inst this initiative has worked in other cases. Or it might be about thinking through different scenarios, um, looking towards the future and thinking about different scenarios in which case uh, things play out in the different ways. The next uh, tip that we talk about is uh, know your numbers, having a strong sense of the of what you're asking, uh, why, and the expected results. The challenge here is that a lot of people like to think the world works in a, in a somewhat orderly fashion. Um, they prefer to know what's going to happen before they approve something. Of course, we know that that's not really how the world works, um, particularly the public sector. So we need to be ready for the questions that might come up. Um, and we need to be able to sell this in a way, uh, despite uh, the burden of proof for innovation being much higher than it is for the status quo. The status quo initiatives already exist. Your innovation is going up against uh, that, and you don't have any counterfactual examples to point to. Uh, some tips here are to think about, well, what is the cost of the current approach? What are the risks of, of continuing on with the status quo? Sometimes that'll be very high. Um, if things aren't working now, well, what, how is that going to play out in the future? Why will it get any better? Maybe now is the time to try something else, and this is the idea. It might be about trying to start small, um, have a, a, a small test case. Uh, of course, some ideas might need to scale, um, so that's not always the best answer. Sometimes it's a matter of just promising with confidence. Uh, you might not really know what's going to happen. Uh, the problem with innovation is that you don't know what the future holds. Uh, so sometimes it's about selling the case, well, we think this will work for the following reasons. There's a risk attached with that, of course, if things don't play out as you might hope or expect. So another example is to, to look for other examples um, within other agencies or within other countries to point to real cases of application of this initiative or a similar idea by other jurisdictions, by other government agencies, um, or even the private sector, where you can show, look, someone else has done it, the world didn't end, um, and they got some value out of it, uh, we might too. Tip number five uh, is that nothing is certain, um, so be ready for the unexpected. What if, in, in short? Um, what if X happens? What will you do if they say yes to your proposal and more? 
What if they really like it and want it to go much bigger? Or what if they say yes, um, and then you learn something new about the project or the idea, and it undercuts what your your argument, your hypothesis. Um, so just think about the unexpected and be ready for it. Next, um, how can you maximize your chances? Uh, you may hear a lot of talk about fast failure um, in the innovation field, but in the public sector, uh, that's rarely a, a welcome thing. We might talk about fast failure, but what people want to see is results. Um, you need to demonstrate some value. So we can tackle that by thinking about, well, if I implement this idea uh, and it doesn't work how I'd hoped or expected, what are the other ways that I can get learning out of this that might be of benefit? Or how can I use this proposal to develop relationships with other players or stakeholders or other parts of your agency so it strengthens those? What are the ways you can think about this so that it will deliver value to you regardless of whether it works or not? Um, what are the multiple payoffs that you might get? And the seventh is um, don't try to anticipate everything. Um, be open to change. Uh, leave some space for people receiving the proposal to provide input. One of my greatest lessons was where I put up an idea to my senior management and I thought I'd anticipated everything. And I had. Uh, that wasn't a good thing because the, this manager in particular didn't like feeling boxed in. He wanted to be able to add his value and his perspective as a senior leader. Um, so remember that in proposals because a lot of managers are going to want to be more than just uh, uh, signing off on this. They're going to want to add their perspective and their experience. So make sure that's built in as in the process. So Alex, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. With these tips, they take different forms in regarding different proposals. Right, so you have written proposals, you have proposals where you're presenting in front of a meeting, you have a Shark Tank style. Um, from your experience, because I know you've done a lot of different versions of this, how do any of these change um, when you're trying to speak about something versus when you're writing about something um, versus a, a quick lightning picture on something? Like, how do how do these tips? Do they hold relevant for all of those situations, and do they do they change at all depending on on uh, the format for how you're doing a proposal or the preferred method for your your leadership how they want a proposal given? I think uh, they hold true for for all proposals, but the amount of attention you might want to give to them will, will vary. Um, I think it's always important to understand the strategic context, but if you're doing a big budget proposal that's going to involve multiple hundreds of thousands or millions or tens of millions of dollars, then that's obviously going to be a much bigger consideration than if you're just playing with an idea in your, in your team context um, and uh, you just need to be aware of the, the agendas that are going on, uh, what are the priorities of your agency. So uh, it's the same issue, but the amount of attention and, and the depth you want to give to it will change. Uh, same with rallying people to your cause. If it's you know just something you want to push with your manager in your team context, um, you just might want to have chatted with a few other people to say, oh, has something like this been done before? Um, is this something you think they'd be open to? Or uh, as opposed to a whole of agency sort of thing where you really need to have much more support and build that coalition that are willing to make it actually work. So. I'm going to ask you another question. By the way, uh, for people whose audio that didn't work, if you have questions, and I know uh, our colleagues chatted it to you in the chat box, if you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat, and we'll we'll address them as they come in. So we we already have one question, which is something that Alex and I discussed uh, a lot right before this, which is um, if the impact of innovation is uncertain, how do you write a convincing proposal? Uh, so that's a really challenging issue with innovation. I mean, that's fundamentally why innovation is difficult. Um, 
sometimes, as I say, it's about spelling out the costs of the now. So it gives, it puts your idea on a more equal footing because it, it helps flesh out, well, doing, staying with what we've got isn't a cost neutral approach. Um, other times it will be about, uh, again, finding those examples that someone has done this elsewhere and you can draw on some data to say it didn't cost that much or it, it was within these parameters or we have a, a rough idea of, of the, the risks and so on. Um, that's not always going to be uh, possible um, and nor is it going to be entirely representative. Uh, there's always going to be the unexpected when you move an innovation from one context to another. Uh, that's what makes it innovation. And uh, sometimes it, it's about uh, linking into that the story element. How can you build the case um, that this matters uh, more than worrying about some of the procedural niceties of it, it will cost this much and there are these risks. Um, I think as any public servant has seen, when either there's a political commitment or a senior leadership commitment to something, all the barriers can fall away. All of the questions about, well, is this really worth it, uh, suddenly become less relevant. So sometimes it's about finding that right convincing case and making sure you've got the right people behind it. Um, but there's no one answer, I'm afraid. So what happens when you do have the killer pitch, you've done all of these things, and you think it's the right thing to do, you know it's the right thing to do, and you still get rejected? Uh, sometimes, you know, you may have the perfect idea, um, and it's just the wrong time. So it's a matter of waiting. Uh, sometimes it's about trying to reframe your idea to better suit that context you're in. So really listening to those political signals about what's important and uh, seeing how your idea connects with those. Um, sometimes it's a sign that maybe uh, you're too far out in front of, of your audience. So think about who are the, the people that you might be able to bring along. How can you build up that coalition of people who are, are supportive of this, of this idea, who really understand why it's important? and can help uh, make the case. Other times it might be about finding uh, outside voices who think this is important. Are there stakeholders who's, who really appreciate and want this thing to happen? Are there some voices outside of the organization or the context who can come and say, this is exactly the sort of thing that matters? Um, sometimes you've just got to think laterally and, and uh, go around it. Other times you just you're going to have to re recognize that this isn't going to happen um, and either wait for a different context or, or give up. Thank you. Um, so we'll head into some of the common issues uh, that happen uh, with uh, proposals. Uh, the first is that um, do the decision makers really understand what they've agreed to? Um, I, I know from my own experience, there have been times where I've spelled out an innovative proposal, I've got agreement, I've walked the relevant people through it, and then I've done exactly as I said I was going to do, and then I get to the end of the process and people seem surprised or confused as to what's happened. And you're like, but, but that's what I said I'd do. Um, because it's new, sometimes people, they don't hear what you're saying. Or you might think you're saying one thing and they don't, that's not what they hear. Um, so do they really understand what they've agreed to? This isn't something you can necessarily solve uh, because you can't get inside their heads. Uh, but it's something to watch out for, to look out for the warning signs that there's a difference between what you've been saying and what they're expecting. Um, but I, uh, I think it's, it's one of those things that you've just got to uh, roll with and, and, and work with what you've got. Uh, the second is around flexibility and, and building in flexibility for when things go wrong or there's unexpected issues. And if it's innovation, there will be things that go differently to how you expected in your proposal. Um, the 
key thing here is to really try to avoid building in critical dependencies that leave you vulnerable to those surprises. Uh, so don't try and, uh, if you've spelt out everything in great detail in your, pro in your proposal and are going to be held to that, then you're going to be in trouble because some of those things aren't going to go as, as uh, you expected. So um, watch out for that and try to avoid being too specific um, without trying to avoid responsibility. Um, third is uh, build in an escape clause. Um, so how can you get out of this project if it doesn't go as hoped? Uh, that's not to say I've started this brilliant idea and oops, I'm leaving. Uh, but it's about what if it, uh, what if the project the project doesn't work as you wanted, um, and how can you shut it off? There's a great uh, tendency within the public sector to start things and keep on going with it once it's been agreed to, even if it's not working. Um, we just keep on investing in it to make it work, uh, and that's really a bad idea with innovative projects. But it's, this issue is also important if the project just goes in a different direction to what you want um, and what you believed in. Uh, it might be something that uh, um, the project might go, go and do something worthwhile, but it's not something that you are deeply interested in, in which case it's probably best if you have an out as well. The third element of this is um, if the project goes exactly as you hoped, and it makes all it's successful um, and it's working, but then it's forever tied to you and it's seen as your innovation in your project. You don't want any project to be reliant entirely on you and resting on your shoulders. Um, it's not a sustainable innovation if that's the case. So make sure when you're thinking about the proposal uh, that there are these sort of escape avenues implied or inbuilt. It doesn't have to be explicit but it's uh, worth thinking about so that you don't end up trapping yourself as the project goes along. Um, it's also important thinking about finding the right balance of information uh, for decision makers. So some of this is about, so you don't want to patronize your, your decision makers or your leaders. Um, at the same time, you don't want to assume that they know everything that you're talking about. Uh, if it's new, it's very likely they won't. But the problem is uh, that most people aren't going to admit um, that they don't know something, especially to someone uh, that they're approving an idea of. So um, how can you think through that and make sure you find the right sort of balance of that information? Generally, the best way to do that is to test it with lots of other people um, and make sure you, you've seen that your proposal hits the right mark with people who are deeply familiar with the issue and those who are only loosely familiar. Uh, and finally, beware of scope creep. Now, this can work in multiple ways. One is, this is a great idea, and we can do this and that, and then we'll also add in this and this other thing, and then the project becomes something that you don't recognize, um, and that's a dangerous thing for innovation, where you're trying to test a few key things, and you don't know it's going to work. The other great risk is great idea, but let's cut out the one part that makes this project interesting and meaningful. Um, and uh, we'll invest in something that no longer really uh, identifies as that innovative project. Um, so again, this isn't something that you can necessarily control, but it's worth being aware of and trying to think about and identify those critical dependencies within the proposal that might uh, make or break this project um, and having decision makers at least uh, attempting to make them aware of it. So Alex, one of the questions I saw uh, through the chat that was happening was about time. How do you uh, not just set expectations, and we'll talk about setting expectations separately, but how do you look specifically at the time element between this has a lot of uncertainty, so I really don't know how long it's going to go to reach the impact that we're trying to achieve, um, versus setting yourself up for failure by saying, this is gonna happen in a year, and knowing that that does not have a high likelihood. Uh, so uh, part of that is 
um, thinking about how can you prototype or test this in reality? Um, so you can scope some of those elements uh, early on. Now that doesn't mean that you you have to test out everything. Um, we have what's called low fidelity testing in prototyping, where you know it can be everything from a wireframe of a website, which can give you a lot of information about uh, what you're proposing and, and how it might work and elicit immediate feedback to um, there are a whole range of design methods where you can basically play out, play out a um, play act out a, uh, a service interaction, or think about what are the different ways that this innovation will work, and then that helps give you more information about what are some of the steps involved, how that might work, what are the dependencies, um, anything you can do in this proposal stage to really flesh out the reality of this. Um, will give you much more information about what's involved and that time element. I think that goes into one of the, the questions that I was saving to the end, which was around first steps. How do I get started in this whole process? And besides the, the problem framing, um, one of the things that you can do to help frame problems is exactly what Alex said, which is, is add play to this and do something in a low fidelity manner to get feedback. Um, uh, a lot of people frame a problem then try to find a uh, low or no cost um, test um, and a, a low fidelity way to, to test these things to see if they have framed the problem correctly and if they are starting to, to uncover any new interesting things. So if you're looking at uh, a minimal risk um, to get started, uh, one, know your context, uh, the context of trying to do innovation as a a uh, public servant in the United States is going to be different than Australia, which is very different than a Brazilian context where we just were a couple weeks ago, which um, has an extremely different context uh, in regards to public servants trying to do new things. Um, know your context, but also do things that, that have limited to no risk at the very beginning. Test things, try to figure out a way for free. Instead of trying to mock up a web page, do it on a piece of paper and get some reaction first. Um, if you're doing a product, uh, there's a Nest thermostat that's one of my favorite examples. It's a very uh, high-end thermostat, but it started out with a roll of duct tape and a piece of paper to figure out if uh, what the display would be on the piece of paper and if the duct tape was the right size to, to get an idea for that. That costs almost no money. Um, so there are ways to get started. There are ways to test. There are ways to validate your hypotheses before you even move into the proposal stage that, one, make your proposal stronger. Uh, but then two also allows you to start getting your hands dirty with some of these activities uh, in a way that doesn't put you, your boss, your organization at risk. Um, and to add to that, I mean, part of this is about your confidence um, and your comfort levels too. If you're new to uh, innovation or new to the environment, new to the organization you're in, you might want to start out small and um, think about, well, what is it that I want to achieve and what am I comfortable trying to push? Um, uh, one of the conversations I've had with uh, Tim Castell, who's a, an academic in innovation practice in, the, in Australia, and he always says, that, you know, no matter how bad your job, everyone has some discretion in their job. There are some things that you control about what you can do and how you work. So I think that's a really important thing to remember of thinking about, well, what is it that I can do differently within my own little job context? What are the experiments I can run just within that that I don't have to ask any permission for? It's just about how I work. Um, and then build from there. Because sometimes it's just a matter of making sure you've got confidence and that you feel comfortable with pushing this. Because uh, it's an unfortunate fact that one of the things that works with innovation and proposals and pitches is that people like confidence. They want to believe that people uh, are confident in what they're selling. So sometimes we've got to build that confidence up ourselves. Um, and we can do that by just starting in our own environment with something small and then bringing in colleagues and other people um, or even people from outside of work to, to uh, develop that idea um, and feel stronger about working in this way. 
So if, any, if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to, to type them into the, the chat box. But we do have one, one more question uh, as of now, which is innovation projects. Government loves to use the buzzword innovation. Government loves saying they're doing innovative work. When proposals come around innovation, especially ones that don't potentially challenge the, the meaning of those people's work, um, how do you manage expectations? How do you manage of, oh my God, the, what you just said of like, do they understand what they've agreed to? And either the results aren't happening and we said we would be innovative and we're already talking about this and we're hyping up this project because it's an innovation project um, or it's, it's appeared different than what's in their head. How do you manage that expectation, especially upwards in regards to innovation because it is such a strong and resonating buzzword right now that, that people are really challenging public sector and especially leadership to, to be innovative? Uh, there's no easy answer to that one either. Part of this is around building up a common language and understanding of innovation. Um, if your organization is new to innovation, it, it will probably tend towards some innovation theater where you, you're talking about it and you're going through the steps, but you're not really interested in uh, the meaty parts of innovation. I think two of the key aspects of what makes an innovation project an innovation project is A, uh, you don't know what's going to happen, and B, it's going to make people uncomfortable. If either of those things are absent, it's really not an innovation. Um, so the more you can help uh, contribute to that language and understanding of innovation as something that's uncertain and uncomfortable, uh, the more people's expectations will hopefully be aligned to what this actually involves. Um, of course, that's, that's sometimes a big ask. So alternate, alternatively, we can think about, um, are there other voices that we can bring in to this? So are there people from stakeholders or partner organizations or other public sector agencies who've been doing innovative projects who can come in and help sh uh, shape those expectations um, and make them more realistic and nuanced. Uh, or it can be about, um, you know, sometimes those expectations won't matter as long as you've got political cover for this. Um, and trying to find that the, the key leadership who can support this. Of course, that leaves you vulnerable if your leadership suddenly moves, uh, which I know from my own experience can happen, and sometimes repeatedly in a short time, uh, which leaves you struggling. So don't rely on that one too much, but it is an option. So let's jump back to rejection, which is uh, a, a fun question of what do you do after your proposal gets rejected? especially if you, you believe in it a lot. I know this happened to, to me in the public service, um, and I would go potentially into the sometimes morally gray area of just doing it anyway and figuring out how to do it either with less cost, less resources, um, kind of behind the scenes in the shadows in some way to start proving that there is value in it. Um, I would not highly recommend that in most cases, uh, but what, what do you do, especially if you truly really believe in what your, what your idea is? Uh, so I think everyone develops their own sort of personal strategies to relate to that. I know for me, I sort of had a rule of three where I would go, I would have three goes at something before I give up on it. Um, uh, for me, that was enough to make sure that I'd, I'd developed the idea enough um, and I was really uh, comfortable with pushing it, but I wasn't going to overinvest in it. <laughs> If you know Alex, there's no such thing as a rule of three. If he believes in it, he's going to keep pushing it until it gets done. I didn't say three of what, but um, working out your, your own limits, though, is important. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of, OK, I, I haven't framed it in the right way. It's not resonating with people in the way I expect. Why is that? Uh, asking some important questions of, I think this is important but it doesn't seem that you regard it with the same uh, value. Why is that? What is it that you know that I'm missing? Um, that can unlock a lot of insight. Or it might be about finding other voices uh, or other sponsors who can take this up. 
sometimes your own management line will be busy with uh, their own priority issues. Uh, they're not going to have space to deal with this, even though this organizationally or system might be really important. Mm -hmm. um, so how can you find uh, workarounds or, or, or other sponsors for this? Uh, th that carries its own risk because sometimes uh, your own managers will then see that as you trying to subvert the process, uh, but it is uh, sometimes also a valuable strategy. So we'll, we'll jump to one last question, which is the question we get on every webinar in some way, shape, or form, which is around failure. Um, personally, the, uh, how do you communicate failure? Um, how do you communicate that a project is not working and therefore we should stop, that the, the sunk cost fallacy uh, of we've dedicated $20 million, so what's another $2 million to continue to try to get it right? Um, yeah, from my perspective uh, and my experience, um, government doesn't talk about failure, uh, but we also are framing it incorrectly. Uh, it, it's really about reframing what failure is, and it's not failure. The idea of starting small, testing, and when things don't work, you've limited your exposure, and then you can test something out is a very different framing than just say, we failed at something. Um, it took me a long time to learn this. My, my first innovative project, or my second, actually ended up failing. And I wanted to use the word failure, and my boss wouldn't let me. Um, and I was really confused why she wouldn't let me just admit that we failed at something. Um, we had a hypothesis, we tested something, it didn't work, we failed. Um, but it was really around switching that perspective. Um, and this is why Alex talked a lot originally, and I'm probably stealing some of his thunder, around making sure that you have more than one goal in mind, um, that learning is a, a goal in a lot of these cases, especially around high uncertainty when you don't know what an outcome is going to be. Um, but that, that's still very tough to do that against the status quo. I know Alex has looked a lot at this from a systems perspective and may have uh, some really good insight talking about communicating failure and how to do this you know, more than just at a one-on-one -on -one level. Well, part of the challenge uh, with failure is that the difference between success and failure can often be uh, wafer thin. Um, I know from the private sector of entrepreneurs who've done, uh, they've done everything uh, they can to make something work, and it seems like it's a failure because something hasn't happened. And then a completely unrelated event changes that failure from something not working to a success. Uh, nothing they did made any difference, but because of an external event, so what was a failure suddenly became a success. Um, uh, that's because a huge amount of innovation relates to chance, uh, because you're dealing with a highly uncertain topic and issue. I know from my own personal experience of having worked on something, uh, I worked as part of DesignGov, which was an 18 month pilot project. Uh, it was a, a whole of government innovation lab. That came to an end after 18 months. Um, in some ways, that felt like a failure, that it didn't keep on going. Um, that was at a personal level and somewhat as a professional level. It felt like I've invested all of this into this and it hasn't kept on going. But uh, some of the, that's also a matter of uh, hindsight, that after a number of years I've been able to see well, DesignGov has contributed to a lot of things. There were particular project elements that have kept on going and that have made some value. There are, I've seen people who've been involved in the process who've gone on to, um, to learn about design and apply it in their agencies. Um, we sometimes have to, to nuance this concept of success and failure to look for there are many shades of failure and many shades of success. It's not always going to be what we think it is. Um, from that wider systems perspective, though, it's a question of, again, making sure that you deliver something even if the prime thing doesn't work as you hoped. Um, that, that's really, really important. It's not easy to do always. But making sure that every effort you have can have multiple payoffs uh, is your best chance of avoiding uh, that word failure. 
So we're about at the end of time, and I want to be uh, cognizant of, of everyone's time here. So uh, for our last slide and really wrapping this up, uh, we have a OECD OPSI website uh, as well as a community platform. Uh, so we will be sending around these slides over email. Uh, and on these slides, there's a link that we'll, we'll also include in the email to register for uh, our community platform, and specifically, we've made an innovation uh, 101 section that you are uh, more than welcome to join. Uh, we we check it. We have conversations on it. If you have additional questions, if you have a, a burning question that you think of as soon as we get off this, and you're like, oh, I wish I had have had a chance to ask that question, um, this is the place to ask it. And, and we in OPSI um, will be happy to respond to it, but also there are other people as part of the community that also may respond to it and have a different perspective than us. Um, in addition to that, this is being recorded. Uh, we will get that recording complete and post it, as well as our last one, which I know hasn't been posted yet due to some, some timing issues. Um, but we will get both of those posted so that if you want to share this with other people, um, please feel free to do so. Additionally, uh, we will have more information about our next webinar coming up. We still haven't figured out the, the scheduling for that just yet, uh, but we intend to continue to finish through this life cycle and continue to bring multiple voices other than just my own. So someone like Alex or we had Perrette uh, from our team last time and continue to bring in more voices into this conversation. Uh, so with that, thank everyone. I thank you so much or we thank you so much for attending the webinar. Uh, I, I hope that you took a lot away from this. Again, we, we would love to hear your feedback and uh, we hope to see you next time. So thank you guys very much.